So the corresponding result in an IV curve is that from the thin line here you had the former the Thomas Fermi semi-classical potential based IV. Now the current IV is um, the peak is shifted to a higher voltage because you have to pull harder in voltage to pull the resonance down. Meanwhile, you're coupled stronger to these energy states E1 and E2 and the current keeps rising. So it requires a higher voltage to pull the resonance down. The IV is sort of linearized and the peak occurs at a higher voltage. Okay, just by including the quantum charge in the emitter and the collector, you change the relationship between the states in the emitter and in the central device. Okay. So now let's look at the uh, charge accumulation on these resonances. So you've seen, in effect, already this current density plot like this. So we, we are at a bias now at 0.46 volts which corresponds to an alignment of C1 with E1. And so there's very strong current flow as indicated in the green line. And now let's look at the charge. So here we have uh, the doping profile in green, and then the electron density in blue. You see the emitter bound state uh, forming here and full of charge. And you also see that there's a lot of electrons in the central region. There's a lot of charge in the central RTD at this bias. Okay, so there's significant charge accumulation, and if there's accumulation, that means the potential wants to float up in the middle. It wants to push that charge out, and the only way out is up. Okay, so the electrostatic potential goes up and it resists the pull down. And that also means that this charge is highly out of equilibrium because there, there's no Fermi level as such defined and in a sense there's charge sitting high in energy so to speak and there's no charge underneath, right? It's sitting in that resonance state that is full and there's not much charge underneath. That's a rather non-equilibrium distribution of charge. The key element here is that this is a nominally Res, uh, symmetric RTD. It's become a little bit asymmetric because we applied a voltage. But still, we have a lot of charge in here. Okay. And due to this asymmetry, we would have thought that it empties out faster than it fills, but it still has a lot of charge. Okay, now let's look at what happens in the valley current here at 0.76 volt where we aligned the central resonance here uh, again with the bottom of the emitter. At that stage basically there's very little supply from the emitter and the well is empty. Okay, So the supply of charge from the emitter is diminished and there's little charge in the well, the resonance has emptied out. And Again, I've shown this similar chart on the previous lecture without charge self-consistency. It didn't change a whole lot. There's a little bit of supply of current that comes from the tail ends of E1 through C1. You see these echoes of E1 and E2 in the current density. And there's about 20% of the current flowing through C1. But that is now much lower than at peak current, so there's little charge and the resonance has emptied out. So how do we understand why this peak current is increasing? Right? It seems like nothing much has happened to the resonances, etc. I would explain this with a change of lever arm. So if you had a linear potential drop, if you had no charge in here, so to speak, you would have a linear potential drop. But we've argued that since we have non-equilibrium charge, this guy floats up, right? It's effectively coupled strongly to the emitter, right? As long as there's supply from the emitter, there's more charge than there ought to be, so the potential tries to pull it down and push it out. 
so it floats up. That means the lever arm over which you drop the potential is mostly happening in the collector. But there's no charge in here, in the, in the barrier either. Right? There's very little charge in the barrier. That means the lever arm goes really up to here, to the end of the well. And since this is floating up, there's more potential now dropping over that collector barrier. So as it floats up, you pull down the gate of the, at the collector and you make it more and more asymmetric that makes that structure more asymmetric, that makes that resonance broader, which makes more current flow. That's why the peak current here is larger. It's not a dramatic effect, but it's still an important effect. Okay, so it floats up in energy along the lever arm, more potential drops over the collector barrier, C1 feels a smaller collector barrier, and the resonance becomes broader. Okay, so let's see if that is true. Indeed, if we now look at the central resonance C1, the width of it, as it's getting uh, floated up in energy, as it floats up in energy, it actually rises up in, in width, right? This is on a log scale, right? So this is width on a log scale. So a little, little bit of blip here is quite a bit of more current. And you also see it drop like a rock again once, it's, uh, once the charge empties out. Because then the potential landscape has changed. So the confinement has changed. So the resonance goes back to its empty state, which is roughly the baseline drop here. Okay, that is why the current has increased. Right? So resonance becomes broader, and then the current increases. So the, here are the key messages of this lecture. The semi-classical charge and quantum charge differ significantly at the interfaces and inside of the RGD. We kind of knew that because the semi-classical charge has charge pile up against the interface and we know the charge should be recessed away from the interface. The electrostatic potential based on a semi-classical charge is a much better approximation uh, to the Hartree uh, self-consistent charge. It's a, they, the two are not completely radically different, right? They're, they're, they're in okay agreement. The IVs look rather similar. They're slightly different compared to this linear potential drop. <coughs> That's why I always call these linear potential drops Mickey Mouse devices, because they, they, they threw out the baby with the bathwater. Because electrostatic potential in a device is the key insight to have. If your device model does not have good electrostatics, you can do all you want. You're never going to really match experimental data. The Hartree is then a nice and insightful modification to the semi-classical charge. And it stretches out the IV, makes it a little bit more linear, and it, linear, it linearizes the IV and makes the uh, current a little bit higher. The subtle message is that even a symmetric RTD has a significant charge accumulation at peak current, which is highly out of look. Equilibrium. Okay, are there any questions? Starting to speed up a little bit on some of these, but you're still fine. You get the physics. And my key is, again, I like to ask you to understand the physics first, right? I'm not showing you equations and details, and I'm not going to hide behind the math. Right? You understand? The, the analytical parts. Okay?